Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. Episode 11, Radical Womb Sovereignty. Samantha Sapora is a reproductive and sexual health educator who provides counseling on everything from ovulation to orgasms, abortions to births, and menstruation to yeast infections. She is also an author and a musician. She brings a holistic approach to her work, seeking to deindustrialize women's reproductive health. In our conversation, we talked about natural contraception, fertility awareness, plant medicine, the ecology of the menstrual cycle, how the pill works, gyne rape, and how men can be allies to women who are exploring these subjects and practices. This episode digs deep into many misunderstandings and mysteries about women's bodies and our culture, and I hope it sheds light for listeners. Yeah, so I'm a radical reproductive and sexual health educator. Um, I provide counseling and educational resources for all of the womb continuum. So that is anything from our ovulation to our orgasms to our abortions and our births and our yeast infections. And I teach with a perspective of body ecology and I use the principles of permaculture to, to really normalize our physiology uh, and help people understand how to gain gain power and pleasure from these parts of our bodies and instead of subjugation. Can you tell me about this concept that seems so central to your work of sovereignty? Sure. Yeah, I I love this terminology and it was actually one of my students when trying to spell it. Uh, who pointed out that the word reign is in the middle of it, R-E-I-G-N. And you know, sovereignty is inherently a political statement. It is around rulership and governance, right? To be self-governing and to have absolute power is to be sovereign. And so when it comes to our reproductive and sexual health, in order to be fully sovereign, we have to have this sense of power, right? Of a queen, reigning on her throne. And in order to be sovereign, we also need to have clarity about the landscape that we are governing. Um, Like, where are its borders? What does it need to thrive and be healthy? What kind of protection and what kind of wealth um, are we able to support as the rulers of these, these lands? To know your borders, I believe you said. Yeah, that's real. Yeah, and and how to defend them. That is also real. I mean, that's a um unfortunate reality that that those of us with uteruses and vaginas are living in is that there is all sorts of different aspects of our environment that uh might invade uh, or do invade whether physically or psychically as it were. Um, but yeah, knowing where your boundaries are and what you do want to accept and partake of, um, it's a, it's a process. So on a practical basis, there's some things that you teach or talk about that are very hands-on, uh, much about, uh, women getting to know their cycles. Uh, so you talk about the symptothermal method of fertility awareness, for example, and I think that a lot of women haven't really heard about this or have misconceptions about what it, it what it entails. Absolutely. Um, so I learned how to track my own ovulation and my fertile window when I was living at Aprovecho Research Center. I'm, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that institute. I've heard of it. Yes. Yeah. It's, um, you know, I was taking an organic gardening and permaculture and alternative technology internship. 
So I learned how to tell when I'm fertile and how I ovulate at the same time that I was learning about soil and seed cycles and the principles of, of permaculture. And so that is a, a huge part of the perspective that I bring to the practice of fertility awareness. Um, the symptothermal method that you mentioned is tracking three primary fertility signals. Um, they are biomarkers. I like to use the term biomarkers. Um, you know, our there's a lot of language and literature out there that actually uses the term symptom. And that's where the word symptothermal comes from, which is really in that, um, you know, really oppressive narrative that identifies our fertility uh, as women, especially as a disease or a pathology that needs to be treated. So you have like a symptom of fertility. <laughs> yeah. Instead of like a biomarker. Um, so a lot of people think that, you know, natural birth control or natural contraception. Uh, and I just want to bookmark that language because I think it's an important conversation to to change our language, to change our perspective around contraception. Um, but a lot of people think of the rhythm method or think that practicing fertility awareness or not using an inanimate object or a pharmaceutical is an extremely dangerous uh, and irresponsible thing to do and that it's not possible to, to be able to navigate um, your own fertility with self-awareness. And there are three primary fertility signals. There are biomarkers that we can observe uh, and be present with and actually use just our, our communication skills and our self-awareness in order to achieve or avoid pregnancy. It's pretty, pretty rad. It's pretty paradigm shifting. I love it. Yeah. And I've known women who have, who have successfully used it as well. And one thing it involves uh, is taking one's temperature every day. Yeah, the temp taking is, you know, it's the most accessible data point that is the most widely observable, like celebrated linear thing that you can put on a line chart. Whereas the other two biomarkers, which are your cervical fluids and cervical position, are a lot more subjective. Um and you know, taking a temperature every day with a thermometer, you would then have numbers and decimal points and data that you can put on a little line graph and and know. Um, however, the the temperature actually only confirms that ovulation has occurred in the past. So it's incredibly important that we be able to have this subjective self awareness of our fluids and our cervical position in order to know what our actual fertile window is, which is around three to six days before we ovulate. So taking that temperature is a confirmation of ovulation, but it is not a predictor of it. Right. Okay. So that's really more for after, you know, uh, some amount of time of doing this tracking, someone's going to be able to, it's giving them a much better sense of what to expect when, uh, especially it sounds like in combination with these other factors. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I recommend fertility awareness and cycle awareness to anybody and everyone that has a cycle, not just as a method of contraception or conception, whether or not we're interacting with sperm ever um, or need to think about pregnancy. It's a really profound way to cultivate self-awareness and to be able to move in synergy with the vital life force that is moving in our bodies, um, that is moving through all creation. Also, um, being able to use it for contraception or conception is like a really happy uh, secondary thing in my mind. Oh, right. Because any of these things you're tracking can be used either way to avoid pregnancy or to try to get pregnant. Totally. Right. I knew a woman who used a microscope as well um, yeah. to look at, I believe it was her saliva. 
And she showed me a couple of different times when she was fertile and when she wasn't fertile. And there was a marked difference. Yeah, there's like a beautiful, very organized fern pattern in our fertile fluids. And it's actually, from what I understand, it's any of our body fluids. Saliva is just, you know, one of the easiest to access. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. So one of the things that you also talk about is herbs. And I have a particular interest in that. Uh, when I was uh, farming in Portland, I made a big effort to grow herbs that are used for women's reproductive health. And so I grew some plants like uh, Penny Royal, of course, um, Blue Cohosh, Black Cohosh, um, Queen Anne's Lace, even though it was a uh, common weed around there. I, I collected the seeds and, and this and that. Actually, this season, I'm in New Mexico. It's super hot down here. So I'm going to try to grow cotton for the mm. for the root bark, right? Because I've heard yeah. that this is a powerful herb too, right? And so in my mind, it's been really important to cultivate these plants and collect the seeds and keep them going in part because the legal and political realities of our nation are in flux and we can't count on things that are legal now to be legal forever. And so to me, it felt important to grow these plants because they might be an important fallback position for us in sort of a worst case scenario. I really appreciate the thoughtfulness and all those plants are really wonderful allies. Um, and actually, I think I feel like you're speaking to a narrative that I hear a lot in some liberal or progressive communities around um, abortion and its legality and the idea that learning how to perform or instigate abortions without needing clinical care is something that we should do to prepare for an emergency or a catastrophe or a situation in which abortion is not legal. That's part of it. And then all, part of it also is just that these herbs are also useful for all parts of the things, right. but I also just really want to normalize the idea that anybody who respects and understands that home birth is a really valid and intelligent option needs to understand that home abortion is also a really valid and intelligent option that is not based on like a reactionary fear-based thing of like, what if there's no legal abortion? It's like, well, what if we just don't need to have any kind of external authority give us permission? Oh, and I that, like where you're going with that. We have access to clinical medical care and tools if we need them, but that fertility and pregnancy and sexuality need to be demedicalized and to be able to take care of our fertility and our reproductive capacities at home ought to be part of our homesteading skills, part of our ability to to navigate our our basic human rights without needing to fill out paperwork or talk to strangers or be under fluorescent lights. Right, right. Yeah, you used the phrase um, demedicalizing and deindustrializing contraception yeah. and abortion. Yes. So, so yeah, let's let's talk a little bit about, more about the herbs because the herbs, like like like, well, let's start with penny royal because everyone's afraid of penny royal, right? And you know, oh, don't ever use penny royal. There were those two women in Colorado who died, you know, et cetera, et cetera, right? And, you know, it turns out the women in Colorado died because they took penny royal essential oil. And if you consume exactly. that much essential oil of really any herb, including oregano, it's probably going to kill you, right? So, but, you know, if you're taking something properly and penny royal as a tea, for example, you know, the amount you would have to drink to harm you would be a tremendously high, you know, high amount. Not that that's not a, an herb to be careful with, but that herb is also good, not just for for an abortion, but also for if uh, if you're stuck that month or whatever. Yeah, well, and digestion, um, really. So talking about herbs in general, I mean, I'm happy to share resources. SisterZeus.com is a great resource. There's a, 
a, my absolute favorite book is um, on the topic of herbs for womb sovereignty is called Natural Liberty. Um, and it's a free PDF online. And I believe it's got like 62 or more herbs and it's got beautiful ethnography and folklore as well as uh, little picture graphic uh, charts of different organ toxicities and dosage recommendations. Um, but really, I just want to bring up this conversation about ecology and body ecology and looking at the functions of the womb and the ovaries and the process of menstruation and the process of how an early pregnancy can move forward within this greater context of body ecology and that we have a problem in our culture of so much fear and stigma around wombs being these like mysterious out of control mythical creatures <laughs> you know, hysteria that folks don't often think objectively and so approaching plants objectively of being like, okay, well, what are we doing here? We're wanting to alter the biochemistry or we're wanting to stimulate the movement of mucous membranes, which is what the endometrium is. So most things that are expectorants are also able to agitate and irritate the endometrium. That's fascinating. Uh, yeah, well, and a lot of things that, you know, pennyroyal is also really great for digestion, right? Is it, It's tonifying to, to mucus and smooth mu uh, muscles, which is what the uterus, the uterus is a muscle, and the endometrium is mucosa. So anything that's going to irritate or move our smooth muscle systems and anything that's going to move mucus in the body is also going to promote bleeding, um, and whether or not we're talking about supporting menstruation when when it has been stagnant and delayed, not due it to a conception or irritating the lining in the case of an unwanted pregnancy, um, understanding the biochemistry, understanding the nerves and the muscles and the tissues, um, rather than thinking or like taking a a potion that's going to fix a specific thing, right? Like understanding the whole context um, is what I, I hope to teach to and think is important. I feel like I lost a little bit of, of a, a point there, but no, no, we will, we'll, 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 we'll circle back. Right. So, so and a and lot plant, of, the, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, just that plants are people too. Um, you know, we don't, I, I don't think it's healthy to, approach plants in a way that you're like, do this thing to me or for you, for me. It's so much more cooperative of a process when you want to be working with plant medicine. Oh, absolutely. Especially considering the fact that many of the plants uh, to work with in this context are wild plants. They're not domesticated plants. And so we need to talk to them differently. Yeah. Um, and so without going too far into specifics, I guess I do want to do like a little plug that I do go very deeply into Materia Medica um, in my conscious contraception course um, that is on my website. Excellent. And uh, so I do teach it in, in depth for folks. And, and this really does start with understanding the ecology of the menstrual cycle um, as a foundation. And then when you want to learn how to intelligently incorporate plants into a conscious contraception process, you need to have the foundation of actually understanding what a healthy, normal menstrual cycle is, as well as what a healthy, normal early conception process is. Right. And with there being such an incredible lack of decent education around these matters in the United oh. States. I, I mean, it seems as though probably most women and most men are ignorant about most of these things, aren't they? Wildly. Totally misinformed and disinformed. Um, but actually, I wanted to circle back to this um, issue of language mm -hmm. around contraception versus birth control. Um, uh, as a continuation of this conversation about what, how seriously medicalized 
these processes are. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. And that the most common vernacular is birth control. Like most people think of anything you would do to avoid a pregnancy as being birth control. And just like, what is that language signal? Right. Like, what? <laughs> so, I mean, I've attended many births. I was a birth doula for a long time. And wanting to control birth is a pretty interesting sort of sadistic, patriarchal, weird thing. Like, it's very unhealthy. And by preventing ovulation, which is what most synthetic hormonal conventional methods of contraception do is they prevent ovulation from happening. We're not controlling birth. We're preventing ovulation. Right. So my fantasy is that we would all start calling those pills ovulation prevention pills. She was like, I have to get up and take my ovulation prevention pill today. We, so that we're actually referring to what they do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's not controlling birth. So we should talk about the pill just for a, a minute here because part right. of the reason the herbs are so important is because the pill has so many issues. Well, first of all, I've been mean, talking about the pill. I would you know, We're silencing the communication between the ovaries and the brain, specifically something called the hypothalamus pituitary axis. And that is really destructive to a whole bunch of different endocrine function. Uh, from mineral absorption and digestion to cognition and all kinds of other issues that arise when you start messing with the endocrine system. It's not a benign act. And then also when you're pissing those hormones out into our environment, we're actively changing the reproductive capacities of amphibians <laughs> in our waterways and many like multiple observable studies. And there's there's a lot of issues with that. There's a there's a wonderful book called Sweetening the Pill uh, that goes very deep expose into this and like Bayer was try like giving this woman violent cease and desist type notices as she did the research. Um, there's going to be a film coming out this year called The Business of Birth Control that is from the same makers that made the movie The Business of Birth or the business of being born, rather. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, Bayer and Monsanto are the same company, and Bayer is making the vast majority of hormonal pharmaceutical contraception available on the market right now. So we have this really blatant uh, like dominating of the fertility of, of both the earth and our bodies, which are the same thing by corporate interests. Um, and that was really what started me on the path towards uh, not taking the pill as a teenager. My, my father really radicalized me at a very young age, and I didn't understand the endocrine system. I didn't understand the, the mythical, beautiful connection that I have with, uh, you know, the, the goddess and all sorts of divine forces that I have access to through ritualizing and connecting with my menstrual and ovulation cycle. I didn't get any of that. I just knew that I didn't want to take a pill that was going to control my body, that I didn't trust the people who made the pill. I was just like, this is way too much access to my intimate world. And I know that corporate powers are nefarious and I don't want to give them access to my body. Wow, that's a nice take on the pill. I never heard this one before, and I didn't know that Bayer was connected to it. And of course, they're a German company with a rather nasty history. Yeah, it's there's the the sorry Emma Goldman quote that I love and use a lot in relationship to the birth control, the contraception pill. There I go, the ovulation prevention pills <laughs> on the market, and it's um merely external emancipation has made of the modern woman an artificial being. Now woman is confronted with the necessity of emancipating herself from emancipation if she really desires to be free. Wow, that's nice. And of course she was arrested in Portland, Oregon for distributing literature about contraception, right? Yeah, I just read her autobiography this year, finally, and she is just my sole family. She even went to midwifery school in Vienna, which is where my sister lives. And I've spent 
several months now and there's actually an international museum of contraception and abortion in Vienna where I've spent some time and got to teach a workshop. Um, so that's a little tangential, but yeah, it's a, it's a really bizarre, uh, you know, Orwellian kind of mind game that so many people think fully think that taking pharmaceutical contraception is a path to liberation rather than subjugation. Um, and I was trained at Planned Parenthood not to criticize or question people's choice and that this idea of choice was the most important thing for us to be promoting. Um, and I really respected that for many years in my practice of teaching and counseling, but I, I was a blog post by a doctor who I really love and respect. Her name is Dr. Lara Bryden. And she had a blog post about contraception. And she said, when it comes to recommending contraception, for me, the most important thing is that we uh, maintain ovulation. In other words, that we not castrate women. That's quite a way to put it. I <laughs> guess that, wow. And for some reason, that was the you know, reading that I finally snapped out of it. And really, when it comes down to it, yes, I am so passionately an advocate for choice uh, and like real consent, true sovereignty. However, we have to also recognize that our bodies are part of this greater whole, uh, this web of society, and that what we put into them affects the well being and the health of many other creatures and beings. Um, so when we look at the systemic and environmental issues around conventional contraception, it's pretty clear that we are per perpetuating harm and oppression by consuming these products, right? And we're, and most people that are taking pharmaceutical contraception are making very fear-based decisions. They're not making decisions that are based on love or self-awareness or embodiment they're afraid and they're doing this thing because they are afraid of their own power essentially and they don't understand it over 60 percent of our culture is not like the the women who could be ovulating are not are you serious yeah uh, no 60 yeah. percent are not ovulating gutmacher institute said that 60 percent. he was like within the last couple of years study um, are they're on hormonal contraception. They're voluntarily medicating away their ovulation. Oh, that many women are, are on the pill or something similar. And then so many others are not cycling well because of stress and environmental toxins. Wow. We have that. And then we have climate crisis with the seasons changing. I don't know. I just, I think of like trying to start a gardener, trying to learn how to farm and or being this ana analogy of you know trying to learn fertility awareness for contraception in a situation where like nobody has a normal cycle yeah we're not quite a hundred percent there but it's like it's pretty tricky things are shifting a lot so i also just want to say that i personally am not a fan of plant medicine as a method of contraception um, at all, at all. I think that observing our primary fertility signals and keeping sperm out of our vaginas when we are fertile is the best form of contraception that I know of. Right. Uh, I, I try not to tell anybody else what to do with their bodies. I'm just like, these are my best ideas. But we have enough bullshit to deal with in our environment as far as endocrine disruptors um, that are shifting our hormones that actually promoting our healthy, normal ovulatory and menstrual cycle is so, so important that most most forms of plant medicine that can be used as an as an ally or aid or a way to instigate contraception, because um, there's varying levels of interaction that you can have. Uh, but most use of plant medicine to prevent pregnancy, disrupts the endocrine system in some way um, or alters our hormonal landscape in some way. And I straw that's the opposite of what I want to do. I want to encourage 
my hormones to fluctuate within rhythm that nature designed, not interrupt it. Because there are enough other things in my environment that are trying to mess with my hormones. So I don't, I don't personally work with plants to avoid pregnancy unless there is an emergency situation or an accident. Right. And so you would see the plants playing more of a part in the recovery from an abortion or miscarriage or just uh, in, in, in the after pregnancy of any kind. Yeah. I mean, to be totally transparent, I see, I see plants being allies all day, every day. Right. <laughs> Me too. But for any process and plants are absolutely um, capable. It's not the most effective or intelligent choice for a lot of people, but plants are, are possible to instigate uh, and to support any kind of pregnancy release process, whether it's an abortion or a miscarriage or a birth, like plants can absolutely help be catalysts for those experiences. Or uh, some people might think that they can cause them. I like catalyst or facilitator. Um, but generally speaking, I prefer plants as like nutritive and supportive role in, in my life and my body and my contraceptive process. Um, I don't know if that answers yeah. the question. Yeah, definitely. Response. Yeah. And maybe you could just give one, just one example of a plant that's good, uh, you know, as a general, it sounds like even as you're saying as a, as a general tonic perhaps for, for, um, nutritive purposes. Oh, gosh. I mean, what comes to mind right now, just because it's the season and they're one of my absolute favorite allies is just talking about nettle, um, which is such an amazing plant for anybody who's cyclically bleeding and great liver support. But that's not related to contraception so much as just womb health. Um, you know, red raspberry is the classic, most common, most, you know, lovely, nourishing, supportive womb herb out there um and by that you mean red raspberry leaf red raspberry leaf sorry yes mm -hmm. thank you well I, I knew that but many listeners might assume the berry as soon as you say that uh, so. yes red raspberry leaf is a great tonifier i personally use plant medicine on a nearly daily basis uh for yeah. any number of reasons just to stay healthy and then have other things that i hit up for you know, particular events or injuries or, or whatever that come up. And so I, I'm, I, you know, I'm right there with you on, yeah. on all of that, you know, and I, I am fascinated by what you've, you've alluded to here a couple of times in which I wrote down before from some notes I took before this, that you mentioned that the four seasons of the earth mm, go, yes. and the four weeks of the menstrual cycle and the connection there. And that's fascinating to me. I've never heard that concept. I'm hoping you can talk about oh, that a little. Oh, my goodness. Oh, I'm delighted to, to elaborate. This is, this is really one of my favorite analogies, and it works so beautifully with principles of, of permaculture and this perspective of body ecology um, and just kind of like this reality that we as humans learn beautifully from sort of mythic creation myth stories. And the way that we move through the seasons is a story that a lot of us already know. Right. Right? Um, and so the analogy of the four seasons being contained in the four weeks of the menstrual cycle, um, there are some different interpretations. There's not like a static thing. It's a metaphor. Um, how I like to teach to it is with ovulation being the summer solstice and the beginning of menstruation being the winter solstice. And the, so the first half of the cycle from when we're bleeding to when we ovulate uh, in scientific terms, this is called the follicular period. And I see that in this story as the season's of winter and spring and then we have ovulation at summer solstice and then we have what's called the luteal phase which is the second half of the cycle which can be interpreted as summer and autumn 
Um, and so this is really interesting. And there's so many different layers that you can put upon this metaphor, right? There's just so much macro, microcosm, cycle, fractal conversations we can have. Um, and there are also lots of um, kind of like archetypal energies that are beautiful with these stories when we get into studying what were the holidays, what were the the deities and the mythopoetic sort of energies that were honored and the rituals that were done in earth worshiping cultures to observe these seasons, to celebrate these seasons, and then apply that to the menstrual cycle. So one example of that that I find pretty entertaining and pertinent to my own life is that the premenstrual week would really start at Halloween or Samhain. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. <laughs> right? As like the veil is starting to lift here. Uh, the archetype is like this wild woman, dark goddess character. And we have more ability to have contact with those on the other side of the veil as we move into that time and then the darkness and the quiet of winter. Um, there's a lot, there's a lot, a lot there. Um, and one other concept that seems to have been blowing my students and, and mentees minds a lot when I share it this year in particular, I've just seen some gorgeous facial expressions and uh, very funny noises that are coming out of their mouths. It is when I talk about this global um, climate crisis situation and the parallel that that has with what hormonal contraception is doing to our bodies, which is trapping our bodies in late summer. Right, because it's holding off ovulation. So... It does, it suppresses ovulation by mimicking the third week of the cycle, what would generally be the third week of the cycle, which is actually post ovulation premenstrual. So the, the mm. synthetic hormones are mimicking the hormonal levels that are natural and innate to this third and fourth week of the cycle, really, which is post ovulatory, the luteal phase the seasons of late summer and early fall. Right. The shedding time. The preparing to shed. Pre preparing to shed. Mm -hmm. The premenstrual week. So we're trapped in the premenstrual week. So you're not only delaying ovulation, you're, you're, you're signaling to the body that you already ovulated, essentially. Yeah. Every day. Wow. That really helps to put all of it into a completely different context. in a state of shock after the war. We interrupt our program for a brief message. If you appreciate this podcast, please consider supporting Colibri on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Colibri. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. And now, back to our regularly scheduled... <laughs> I've had a couple of experiences where I was at Planned Parenthood with a friend who was um, having an abortion there. And I remember thinking that the process was, well, you mentioned fluorescent lights before, right? And of course, yeah. the, 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 the process was very clinical. And mm -hmm. the people who were there were keeping this sort of banter of small talk up, mm. which prevented uh, my friend from actually really being fully present with what was going on, you know? Uh, and then she said that afterwards, the recovery room that she sat in just had these sort of chairs against the wall. And her first, you know, thought that came into her head is, wouldn't it be nice if the chairs were in a, in a, a circle or something like in that? In a you circle, know? yes. Right? Yeah, so that you could look and see, oh, other people are feeling things too. I'm not alone in this. I'm, I'm with other people you know, at this moment and on this journey, mm. you know, and then of course, really, there wasn't any suggestion that was given as to how to recover, 
how to recover from this process, you know, just a, well, if something goes wrong, call us kind of thing. And so that's really where you're trying to step in here, you know, holistic healing after abortion being one of your, one of your books, you know? Hey, yeah. Yeah. We are hyperdimensional people, uh, beings, you know, like our bodies are one aspect of our being. So like the muscles and the tissues that were involved in that abortion are one aspect of our well-being. And then we also have psycho-spiritual and emotional realities that are equally, if not more important in the way that they actually do influence our physiology as well. Um, there's, you know, they might actually, you know, beliefs shape biology. There's some science behind that also. Um, so when I work with people around abortion, I want to create space for them to have healing and witnessing on all dimensions and the physical right to have access to have this tissue or this embryo removed is one aspect of our care that should be a basic human right. And then actually having an invitation to explore the meaning of this process is another invitation. Uh, we need we need access to care that acknowledges that we're not just bodies and just machines. So, yeah, I wrote I wrote this little book, um, Holistic Healing After Abortion. And I also have one that is on the topic of miscarriage. And those books are meant for people that are in that process or are care providers for that process, uh, community members, loved ones. Um, and then I also have an entire course, the, my 10 module e-course, all about holistic miscarriage and abortion care. And uh, clinically speaking, actually, all miscarriages are technically abortions okay so it just means that what was in the uterus is no longer in the uterus you were pregnant and now you're not pregnant which i think is really profound and it speaks to my philosophy uh and the, the one what i teach people is just like get clear on the physiology and try and let go of your projections and biases as to the meaning um and create spaciousness for that individual who's actually having the experience for the meaning and the emotions to be authentic to that individual. Like I see myself when I'm a care provider in those situations as, uh, you know, like a protector and a cultivator of sacred space. And the, the goal is to create a space where that individual can actually fully experience and explore and integrate and heal from whatever is actually true for them rather than trying to impose these, these cultural narratives because some people have ecstatic abortions and some people have miserable, depressing ones. And actually it's whatever it is for that person. Yeah. I've, I've, I've known people who've gone through, through both of them. Okay. So partly who you're working with are, directly with women who are going through these things. And then you're also working for different kinds of, of care providers. And I think you'd used a phrase somewhere with the care providers of working with them about how to work uh, with, not over. I think that's the phrase you used. Power with instead of power over. That's it. I was hoping you could talk about that for a minute, power with and rather than power over. Oh, I mean, it comes back to sovereignty, really. It reminds me of, um, so for many years, actually, I worked as a birth doula primarily. That was my uh, the little box that I sat in for, you know, that's validated on a, a wide cultural level of just like, this is a job. Mm -hmm. You can have credentials for this job and get paid, mm -hmm. uh, which I've since busted out of and just started doing what I do. Anyway, um, every time that I walked up to the hospital doors with my birth client, I would whisper like, you're the queen. Every single person we interact with here is your servant. Nice. 
And if they don't serve you or please you, then we can send them away. (laughs) Very well done. So that's a total subversion of that power dynamic that's normal in the medical system and in care provider relationships. What would be good would be like a more equalizing thing and that you're speaking to, right? Power with instead of power over is um, is a socio-political philosophy. It's mutual aid. Uh, it's it's anarchy. Um, it's it's this reality of wanting to approach each individual and their own path and knowing that they know what's good for them. And that as if if we're a care provider approaching another human being in their path, that we're not there to project our ideals or our values or to control the situation. We're there to support the individual uh, with their own power. And these power relationships that we're seeing in the in, in the medical community and these other places obviously are a reflection of uh, patriarchy at large. Yeah. Did you ever read Witches, Nurses, and Midwives? No, unfortunately, I have not read that yet. Barbara Einrich. Mm. Um, there's a free PDF reader on online. Um, I recommend that to everyone, anyone who wants to have insight into what is going on with the modern medical paradigm and uh, just very short and sweet and clear, you know, there, the, that uh, what that brings up for me also is this parallel between the industrialization of agriculture and the medicalization of our fertility and birth and how similar those processes were and that there are paper trails. There is specific propaganda and government involvement of like a very small number of wealthy white dudes wanting more money and more control of everything and creating all kinds of systems of power and institutions where their elite uh, status and money were what were in control and taking the sovereignty of the common individual to be able to eat or reproduce without being completely dependent upon the systems of oppression. Right. And the the takeover of the birth process by men is actually fairly recent historically, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's we're it's around like the late 1800s, I believe. Right. Right. Which on another tangent makes me want to throw out the stat that not the stat, the fact, pardon, that, uh, you know, the Catholic Church wasn't publicly or officially anti-abortion until 1865. Oh, I did not know that. <laughs> yeah. And so, I mean, it, it has this parallel with, with the, industrial, um, the Industrial Revolution and what, what was going on in terms of needing more workers. Ah, uh, right. Right. Okay. <laughs> um, but I feel like I just diverted you were fr- from a thought that No, that's that's there. that's that's fine. I mean, I can talk about any kind of history all day long, but I mean, yeah, yeah. The, 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 that the Victorian age, obviously the late 1800s is a source of of so uh, many misconceptions that are still with us to this day about yeah. anything, about 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 birth, we could say, but but about, you know, ancient people, about um, animals, you know, the whole idea that, you know, animals don't feel pain was really popular then. I mean, yeah. it was a, this was a really brutal time, the late 1800s, and we haven't, we haven't really gotten over Recovered. it yet. Yeah. No, no, we haven't. Oh, yes, which reminds me of a quote I wrote down that I saw on your Instagram that I really oh. appreciated. It said, um, heal so that we don't have another generation of trauma passing itself off as culture. Oof. That's nice. That's yeah. really powerful. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I don't know who said that. That was a meme. That wasn't me. Yeah. I make that meme. Um, but what that reminds me of is another quote about culture that is from one of my favorite teachers, his name is Michel Odant. He's a French obstetrician, super brilliant man, pretty 
single, like very much responsible for water births existing in hospitals. Okay. Um, and just, he's actually got a book called The Farmer and the Obstetrician that speaks specifically to this this conversation about the industrialization of agriculture and the medicalization of birth. It's really beautiful. Um, but he, he said in a class, I got to take an eight hour class with him and he said, what is culture is normal and what is physiologic is universal. And saying that in a in a way that was drawing attention to the fact that what is normal in our culture is actually not physiologic right so our cultural norms around sexuality and reproduction are not in alignment with the universal principles of our physiology right for example the idea that everyone thinks that women give birth lying down. <laughs> right. <laughs> and that the human pelvis, the female human pelvis, much, much strongly prefers to be in a squat or on all fours in order to open to give birth. And it turns out gravity is a law. And so <laughs> using gravity to help you with this process of birthing is also really helpful and not possible when you're lying down. So we have this like massive difference between what is culturally normal, women giving birth lying down or on their backs, and what is the physiologic truth. Um, so, I mean, circling back to the heel so that we don't have another uh, you know, generation of trauma pa- passing itself off as culture is like the cultural norm for us is having a traumatic experience being a bio female right Right. is experiencing not just our birthing but our sexuality and our fertility our menstrual our menstrual cycles our sexual experiences our birthing experiences the cultural norms are that we endure these experiences that they happen to us that they're done to us rather than our ability to actually identify with our biology embody it rather than dissociate from it and say, I am this, I am fertile, I am menstruating, I am giving birth, rather than like, I got my period, I got laid, I got pregnant. Uh Ah, you're right, you're pointing out something in the language there that I had not noticed before. Yeah, of course, language is a big part of, of, of culture and of tradition. It's the the main way of conveying it. Yeah, which can be positive in other contexts. And obviously, you know, that's how the important secrets or the important skills or the important beliefs can be passed on. But also it can be used the opposite way, depending on, well, obviously just depending on what kind of culture it is. And the one that we have is 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 by and large patriarchal and, and destructive. Yeah. Yeah. Another word you know, etymology that I love to break down for people that is pertinent to reproductive and sexual health is this word consent. Oh, let's talk about that. Right. So in our culture of, you know, both the medical world and the sexual world, consent is usually framed as permission, right? Like, I'm going to give you consent to do something to me. Right. Or for me. But the etymology of this word is Latin con together and sentir, which is feeling. Oh, of course it is. I hadn't I hadn't (laughs) thought of that before. Right. So what is consent? It is feeling together. It is actually a feeling that feelings are physical. Feelings are visceral. Feelings are a quality of resonance that we can have with one another in order to move forward in any action with consent, we need to have resonance and be able to feel together. So, you know, an, a, like a meditation that I do sometimes with my students uh, or clients is like, what if we really demanded as a culture and as individuals that any time 
that anything came near or inside of our vulvas or vaginas that we actually had true consent. Right. <laughs> that we were feeling together and that both parties felt like that was the highest good to move forward. Right. And that acknowledging that gyne rape is probably more common, if not at least just as common as sexual rape. And that routine pap smears and pelvic exams are done without true consent. Constantly, women are spreading their legs and being penetrated by speculums from well-meaning care providers, but they're making choices out of guilt and shame because they think it's what they're supposed to do rather than actually feeling like, oh, I really want this information about the cells on my cervix. I would really appreciate it if this person would take a swab of my cervix because I fully feel that that's the best choice. And I understand why this is happening rather than these fear-based choices of like, oh, you need to go in and do this thing and you're, you're going to be penetrated by a stranger because it's for your highest good because some external sense of authority says you should. Yeah, let's back up for a second there. You used a, a phrase I hadn't heard before, but you then explained it well, but I want to just call it out so people can think about it again. Gyne rape, you said. I did say that. And that, you know, whew, that's a very charged word. And I have a lot of awareness and sensitivity that a lot of people don't like it when I use that word to describe things that happen in a gynecological setting uh, or an obstetric setting um, or the word birth. I feel like I've, I've used the word birth rape more consistently than many others. I've, you know, when I was actually in my early twenties and I first started attending births in hospitals, uh, if I was at a social gathering and was feeling a little too sassy and someone asked me what a doula was and I wasn't in the mood to explain it very nicely. I would say like, I am a ninja who prevents rape, institutionalized rape rather. Um, and be like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> like, well, the act of birth is a sexual act and people are being cut and drugged systematically by an institution for profit. Right. So, I think, yeah, forced penetration, non-consensual penetration, bodily violation in a specifically overtly sexual landscape of our body through coercion and non-consent. So when you talk about these these subjects with, with women, do, by and large, are they if they haven't heard of these words before or, or even thought of these concepts before, do they have an immediate resonance with most of the women that you talk about? Um, you know, I, I must say that I probably exist in a really strange little radical bubble and the people that gravitate to me are probably already, you know, more receptive to this. So, um, I would, yeah, I would say the majority of people who I share these concepts with, experience, you know, the Gloria Steinem, <laughs> the truth will, will set you free, but first it will piss you off. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. So like a lot of women, I think that I, that I talk to about these, this concept of guy and rape or birth rape, uh, who have experienced violations themselves and had normalized them because it is culturally normal. Um, don't, you know, it's not nice to think that you've been raped it's not a it's not a very pleasant experience but it's also a way of understanding how being forcibly penetrated is wrong and should not be tolerated and so i mean that's the the ultimate intention and goal around the use of this strong language is to communicate how serious the violation is and that it needs to stop and so most of the women that I speak to um, around this or counsel around this or explore these co these concepts with fe find meaning 
that ultimately empowers them to be more sovereign and to demand consent before penetration in all settings. I mean, that's the ultimate goal around the use of that language and those frameworks is to create a cultural shift where vaginas are not being penetrated without consent, period. I guess part of my question was just that maybe women have felt these things before, but never had, because our culture doesn't talk about it that way, hadn't put it in that context or whatever. And, and that being a contrast to further with men who have not given these things any thought at all. I mean, until you talked about it today, I had not thought of this concept of guy and rape. I mean, now that you're talking about it, I'm like, okay, now this makes sense to me. Of course, this fits with everything that's oppressive about the medical system and our culture in general, but I hadn't, you know, I mean, now here I am 50 years old and I never given a thought to this concept before, but if I had gone through these procedures, surely I would have felt something like it. Yeah, I think it's, you know, a lot of women definitely have felt it and not had the words or the language or the validation to acknowledge it. Yeah. So there must be some large part of your work, really, that's just helping to bring things out into the light. That is that that's it. <laughs> that's all I'm doing forever. <laughs> I mean, it's like the irony of the metaphor also, because, you know, I, I teach cervical self exams. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> with speculums. And, um, you know, our uteruses and our ovaries and our vaginas are in the dark. Literally, they're not widely visible. And so, yeah, all of my work is about bringing light into the dark. <laughs> that's what it is. Right. Yeah. Now, there must be some portion of, of your work on, on the physical and metaphysical levels that is also uh, applicable to men and to oh, their bodies, yeah. because, I mean, if only for the reason, the physiological reason that the tissues are the same, that are just taking different forms. Sure. I think there's a lot to be learned. I, I don't, I actually don't know a ton about about testicles and penises. I have pretty general knowledge. I just learned about the cremaster. Did you know about the cremaster? Uh, uh, nope. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I should. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little muscle that lifts the scrotum depending on temperature and stress to try and protect. It's a, it's a very special little muscle in the pelvic floor. So I've been, I've been studying biomechanics lately a little bit. Uh, and reading more about pelvic floor muscles. So um, I think for men, I, you all came out of this body. Right. <laughs> right? <laughs> this is your source. Like there are how many infinite religious and mythic philosophies and pedagogies, ped pedagogy that are all about exploring our origin, right? Right. Like, where do we come from? And I'm like, let's just start with the uterus. And I really passionately believe that every single human has a lot to learn from understanding the cycles of the uterus. There is so much metaphor and so much practical information about how to be alive and how to go through transformation and rites of passages that are pertinent. So I can't, you said like, oh, it's useful for men because we have the same tissues and like, yes, we're all made of the same thing. Um, but I think that it's more specifically uh, just an amazing lesson in humanity and in life force and how life force moves. I mean, for example, the birthing process, right, that the entire globe is going through not that I know exactly what is being born or if it's a miscarriage or an abortion or a birth of a live baby I don't know but I know a contraction when I feel one <laughs> ah and you're referring to the the pandemic when you say this I mean I feel like we've been in a state of contraction for a while yes I agree with that um but yeah I am the pandemic is definitely an acute example of that for sure and just understanding the ways that wombs function physically has a lot of medicine for understanding how growth and life moves in general for, for everybody. 
I think um, we've, we've talked for about an hour now, so I think this is pretty good. I wanted to ask you, I wanted to end with a, with a question about how is it that men can support women who are pursuing and trying to understand their own sovere sovereignty? And so whether these women are, are their girlfriend or their lover or whatever, but also it, their sister, their friends, yeah. whatever, just like, how is it that men can be allies and be supportful of women in their lives on these issues? Gosh, how to get simple about that. I just want to say that I've been working on a, a new course called Sermon for the Sperman. <laughs> you have such a way with words. <laughs> That will be all about that. So uh, I guess, I don't know, the first thing that comes to mind is just this like really pop hashtag believe women thing, which is just like being able to respect that our felt experience is the truth and not gaslight or shame or try and control or analyze what we're feeling is a really great place to start uh, in order to be able to be an ally and a support person is to be able to actually hold space for whatever it is that we're feeling about whatever's going on there. I hear you. And then, yeah, I mean, get, get educated, like go down, load my free ovulation awareness zine on my website. <laughs> Uh, but no, like learn the three primary fertility signals, learn about what we need to eat, get in touch with the cyclical nature of the moon and the earth and be reverent and recognize that the, the visceral processes that are going on inside of our bodies are a microcosm of those greater processes and it would be healthy for for men to be reverent of this instead of fearful or trying to control or dominate that's a great way to put it thank you very much yeah cool well thanks for joining me today hearing about your your new book i'd love to have you back um, when that project is done to talk more about that yeah someday thank you i uh -huh. guess that's my my big vision fantasy moving forward right now is youth education, but I also recognize men. And then I'm just like, oh, I just need to be like common denominator, like eight year olds through men and <laughs> everyone, because also adult women don't know it. But my goal is to get a lot more simple and a lot more artful and theatrical in the coming years um, as in how I communicate all of these super complex concepts, but just to focus on ovulation and menstruation as a basic foundation that all humans need to understand this basic process that they all came from, that this is the origin story instead of looking to an imaginary male figure in the sky, we need to look to this cycle and understand that it's our origin. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. -L -L For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit radiofreesunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.